All right, I think we're live now. I'm here with Kyle Broussard, and we're here to talk about a fascinating talk that just went down at Harvard University um, a few months back, but it went live, and we've been hearing all sorts of reports about anti-Semitism and um, other things. So we're here to talk about circumcision and Eric Klopper and well anti-semitism and jews and should we hate them or should we not it's a completely normal civil morning conversation kyle how are you doing i'm doing all right uh, i mean this is a normal conversation for you know people like you and i let's be fair here <laughs> uh, we get into these kind of intellectual discussions almost anytime you and i see each other so yeah no it's 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 always the edgy stuff that's the the most fun. They, uh, when I was growing up, they used to tell me don't talk politics or religion around the around the dinner table. Now they're just like, Chris, please only talk politics at the religion table. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have uh, I've lost many friends. I've lost many acquaintances. Oh, yeah. But you uh, gain friends too, so it's okay. Right? Yeah, that's that's very true. It's just a matter. Of, I don't like to do the uh, the small talk. I can't learn anything about you if, if we're like, "Hey, how's the weather?" Well, it's sunny. Well, congratulations. We agree. <laughs> I'm exactly. with Ron. I'm with Ron Paul on this one. It's uh, we have the freedom of speech not to talk about the weather, but to talk about controversial things. Right. So so let's get into this. Um, you just watched this speech this, either last night <laughs> or this morning. I watched it yesterday, and f I was frankly a little blown away by it. I thought this was an extraordinary performance um backed up with a lot of data and information that a lot of people aren't aware of i would like to emphasize the uh, the word performance in that oh yeah oh yeah no one of the most extraordinary things is that this kid is he sounds like a pretty smart dude from the perspective of science and physics and being able to research things but he i thought his true genius lay in his rhetorical and oratorical skills like that was a very – he hit the ethos, pathos, logos perfectly, especially for a college audience, for, for people who are a little bit older like my wife and uh, another guy I was chatting with online. They were like very much not impressed by his antics. They were like embarrassed on his behalf, especially towards the end. Like this is just shameful. No one should do this kind of thing. But um, – <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of siding with them on this one. Um, yeah, well, that's because we're older, right? It's because it's because we're a I, little bit. <laughs> we're I, not. I, I, in all honesty, I think it's. Uh, I mean, you you are you're a little bit more religious by nature. Um, yeah, a little bit. I am, by and large, uh, atheistic. Everybody knows this about me. Who's ever met mm -hmm. me? Uh, you know this about me. Uh, I I think that he was pandering, a bit. Um, oh, sure. I, I, do, I do agree with you that, uh, yeah, it was good for a college crowd, but overwhelmingly, it starts to nullify anything that you're trying to talk about when it comes to gaining traction in the levels that he's looking for. Like, sure. the part where he's literally starting to spout off that these people will, will fear me. They yeah. will, they will, you know, they're going to be scared of me and they're going to, they're going to hate me. It, it really went into a form of, you know, egoism that I was not expecting, especially oh, yeah. from the first hour. The egoism yeah. was pretty, pretty shocking. And and for those people who are listening who who haven't seen it yet, first of all, you should go check it out. And I put a link in the description on this video so that you can look at it. But he begins this, you know, two hour presentation with a lot of facts and going into the anthropology behind the organ origins of circumcision, why it was done originally. And then in the second half, he rips his shirt off he's screaming and cursing about his, at his father and it, it, it saying he's going to tear the covenant down of his ancestral faith it's it's very different tone to put it mildly yeah. um and it was a theatrical performance and you can tell by how smooth and fluid his transitions are from that he'll go from screaming and talking and then he'll sit down on the stage and he'll speak quietly and that is that that takes skill and practice and and self control to do that. And it doesn't look self controlled, but that's the point. Yeah. So, that doesn't it doesn't mean it's inauthentic. But by, by the way, uh, the but the way he started about uh, talking about the religious ideology behind it, the the mm -hmm. fundamentalism, and the, 
and the uh, the historical practices, especially even leading up until today, talking about the moil, uh, the Jewish uh, handler, or I would say circumciser, uh, who, especially in the third one, I, I did a little bit of research on circumcision, especially from uh, the Judeo standpoint, when I was going through uh, Christopher Hitchens' God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. Right. This is actually where I started to learn about it. So, yeah, by the way, shameless plug for Christopher Hitchens, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. I recommend you buying it and reading it. Um, but he actually talks about the moils and the practice that has been seen in uh, New York, which the law was recently upheld, that they are allowed to continue this. So that's why it still persists, is based on religious practices and religious freedom, is where they will take the foreskin into their mouth, suck it off, as well as a mouthful of blood and spit it into a holy container, um, which ended up giving multiple boys, uh, I believe it was herpes. Yes. So uh, when he's going through that, it shows a lot of uh, a lot of you know, backing, a lot of proof, scientific ideology or scientific um, processes that and a historical. Uh, process like actually going through and researching everything they need to be able to pr you know present this accurately that I had no problem with when he starts talking about even as an atheist ripping down the covenant ripping down the faith it's like okay what is your what is your ulterior motive because right now I could I was completely on board with the whole uh, yeah we should probably start getting away from this practice because there's no real fundamental reason that we do it other than religious observation and historical tradition. Well, that if, if you're with people like uh, Jonathan Hyde and Dr. Jordan Peterson and a few others in the, in the psychological field, um, there, is a, there is another religion that's becoming predominant. There, there's actually a number. Um, a gentleman writing a response to something I wrote a while back said um, – Moralistic therapeutic deism is the most popular religion in the United States today, which I love that phrase, <laughs> moralistic therapeutic deism. Um, but but there there is a kind of progressive religion that we're experiencing now too, which which he holds uh, the human individual and humanity generally. Um, it's not exactly identical to, to humanism, I suppose, but but it's a different value set that's held to be sacred. And I think what Eric um, Klopper is is running into here is a religious conflict between the ideals of progressivism, of human rights, which he brings up over and over again, bodily autonomy, all these other things, <coughs> because. In, in the traditional Jewish religion, and I think this is true in Christianity as well, um, your body doesn't belong to you, you know. Um, whereas in sort of uh, liberal progressive humanism, it's taken pr um, a priori that, of course, your body belongs to you. If it doesn't, you're a slave. Yeah. And, um, and so, so there's a, it's a religious conflict there. And, and y y it's... I think it's makes most sense of this whole thing to put it in that context um, because everything he was advocating was religious. It's just progressive, you know, t uh, talking about the, the violation of bodily autonomy uh, in particular, it seems to be the core of his, of his complaint. Now, what I found fascinating is he actually hits on, the reason why I believe him to be wrong um, in his talk when he was talking about hazing and the, the social cohesion value of hazing. Um, for those who are listening, his argument was that uh, circumcision arose as a form of like ultimate hazing, not for the infant being circumcised, but for the father who had to watch his son being circumcised, which was an extremely traumatic thing for the father to watch and it gave them this buy-in experience this extreme pain that you then channel into a sense of meaning yeah he he basically was he was trying to make sure that people were aware that uh tribalism and this is actually true in, with my time in the marine corps that we attribute a value to pain because if you've right. put in a certain amount of pain that's a certain amount of value invested in which case it's more than likely going to you know, keep you around. I've already put in this much pain, suffering, blood, tears, so on and so forth. 
I might as well stick with it. And that's that kind of binding mechanism for the tribalistic nature in human beings that really kept uh, the, I believe he was trying to indicate the Jewish tribe going. Yes. And, and, and when, I mean, I wasn't in the Marines as you were, but I was briefly at Marine Corps boot camp. Story for another time. And um, when I was down there, I remember sitting in the chow line once and one of the drill instructors came up to us. And he was he was talking with us, and he said it, it was a heartbreaking thing to listen to because he said it serious with none of that drill instructor grit in his voice. He says, "You know, when I went through boot camp twenty years ago or whatever, they beat the shit out of us, and we were better Marines for it. I pity you guys because you're going to be worse Marines than us." And all of us felt just awful about that. <laughs> yeah, that that still goes on. Um, I will say that there are certain because I, I know at least I was at this part of it. I can't compare myself to Marines of old. Um, sure. I do know there's things that go beyond behind the scenes with some of their better recruits, the ones who are really dedicated in becoming a Marine. There's, oh, yeah. You pretty much dedicate yourself, and there's nothing you're going to do that will pretty much uh, put any kind of shred of doubt um, in the instructor's position to instruct you. Mm -hmm. So we, we inherently trust our instructors... Uh, as did I, and there are some people who are, you can kind of tell with it, and there are some people you just kind of steer away from it. I was one of those kind of people who were like, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Do whatever the hell you're going to do to me because I'm going to be a fucking Marine in the end. Yeah. And people, there's probably about five or six of us that literally just got welcomed back into the uh, into the instructor's quarters, and we literally just got the shit kicked out of us. Literally just a, like, right when I walked in there, I got a nice punch right to the solar plex and kicked like six, six seven times while I was on the fucking ground. So, I, will I say that it made me a better Marine? I think it prepared me more. Well, and, and even if it doesn't make you a better Marine as an individual, the effect overall is it creates a more cohesive and stronger Marine Corps as a group, which is the, yeah. the purpose. Every, everyone has this sense of, of buy-in. And my brother, who spent some time in, in the sandbox, um, is convinced and, and quite resentful about it, too, that... Um, that the Marine Corps is being ruined, essentially, by people who who are opposing hazing and reporting on hazing. So, so the destruction of an institution by taking away the the means of retaining social cohesion and in group um, solidarity is, is a real phenomenon. And so, and and that brings us back to circumcision in an odd way, because the 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 big thing I, I got from Eric Klopper's presentation was a deep-seated resentment and, and, and hatred of what had been done to him and what his religion of birth had, had brought into the modern world. And at first <clears throat> glance, kind of understandably so. But, but my thought was like, this, this practice, if what he was saying in the anthropological section is true— and 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 by the way, the Jews were not the only people doing circumcisions. He points out that the Jews actually adopted it from another other groups in that time. Yep. If, if what he's saying is true, and if Jews are as persecuted as we all know that they were throughout all of history, so and it wasn't just circumcision that that caused that, then this practice that retained in group solidarity and stuff is very likely responsible for your survival and being here today. And it, it seems, and, and that doesn't say anything about the scientific factuality of all the, the points he, he made in the earlier part of the presentation. It could be, we could still uh, get behind stopping circumcision. This is a practice, it, it did us well, it got us to, to survival, to, to here today, but we should, we should stop it. Um, but it seems profoundly ungrateful to, to look back at this practice in, in an odd way. Well... It, it kind of sounds like you're making the argument along the lines of uh, siding with the lesser evil um, mm. it, in a kind of a broader sense. I'm trying to muscle that in. It's the... <laughs> sure. I, I understand what you're going for. I, I would push back on... I, I completely agree that he was resentful. You could hear it in his voice. You could see it in his actions. You could obviously tell from the presentation that he was extremely upset mm -hmm. uh 
whether that be false or not, whether it be an act, uh, you could you you could tell that there was a lot of emotionality in his voice that showed, yeah, this is something to care about, and you should be very angry about it. Right. Um, but with that being said, the I I can't disagree with him on the idea that we should go away from it. Uh, sure, I, I'm not disagreeing either. I, I, I don't plan on circumcising any boys that I have. But but the question that I'm asking, if this is the argument that you're claiming, is should we be angry or should we not be angry of it simply because it helped our survival? In which case, uh, should it get a pass simply because you should be grateful that you're here now? Well, so... <laughs> I remember being in a biology class once, and I don't remember which year it was, but the, the professor said something to the effect of evolution is smarter than you are. And I think that's true as far as social institutions go as well. So what these, what these religious and, and ethnic groups adapt as survival strategies, and, and whether they work or not, most groups don't, didn't survive. Um, especially most groups that got persecuted and attacked and, and harassed to the degree that Jews did, um, which I think was mostly a byproduct of the region that they came from. Basically, everyone was harassing everybody, no matter who you were. I mean, the, the, the Greeks were harassing each other like crazy. The, the Hittites and the Assyrians were taking each other over and everything. Yeah. Um, so... And they all come up with slightly different ways of, of dealing with this stress and, and trying to, to make it through. If you're Spartans, you're just going to try to create superhumans, and that works for a little while, and then it collapses. Um, if you're uh, Athenians, you try to be open, and you try to talk everything through, and that works for a while. And, and the Jews' strategy seems to have been let's turn in on ourselves circle the wagons and be in kevin mcdonald's terms a, a people that shall dwell alone basically and it's a it's an extraordinarily creative and and a very dark idea that we're going to make everyone in our society do this blood sacrifice buy-in which uh, with the with the um circumcision and, and that will keep us uh, solid as a group. It will keep us coherent and, and separate from other people as a group, and that will ensure our survival. It's a, it's a brilliant and dark and a, a very uh, – it's a high-cost strategy. But I have to admit, historically, it looks like it's paid off for them pretty well, although well, we I can see how many people today, looking back from the comfort of modernity, might mm -hmm. say, well, maybe that wasn't worth it. Maybe it was unnecessary. Well, we see that today. I mean, this is kind of a, a stretch. Again, I, I normally grasp out of things that I see in today's world. Mm -hmm. uh, we see this in uh, today with a lot of the, not the I'm not going to call them a cult, but it's like the Hollywood elite. Uh, they actually have dirt on each <laughs> other uh, that they've talked about a lot. Oh, hey, yeah. we, like, we have pictures and things like this of them having pedophilia or pedophilic natures and and videos of them sleeping with little boys and little girls. Yeah. Why? Because you have dirt on me that creates a strong in-group to where it's like, I know you're not going to dime me out because I can literally just ruin you. Uh, I wrote a I wrote a piece for, for the blog, actually, uh, about a year ago on... This was back when Pizzagate was becoming a thing. And I wasn't really persuaded one way or the other whether Pizzagate was real or not. But the, the idea that there's a lot of pedophiles at the top of society seemed rather odd because we don't have enough pedophiles for that to work and so so why would that be the case and and that was exactly the conclusion i came to i think it was because sargon had just put out a video about david cameron and the pig head um <laughs> did you <laughs> and it's exactly what you're describing it's exactly what you're describing you have, if everyone has dirt on each other then you're all in on this and if you commit this act of of circumcision that a works like hazing and gives meaning to each other but b separates you from everyone else and everyone looks at you as more of a foreigner then you become dependent upon each other because you have no one else there's no other options well um, you also see it in, in the form of economics uh you knew sooner or later i was going to bring up economics don't lie uh 
The but that's also attributable to the fact that they they don't charge each other interest. So in that in group preference, mm-hmm. traditionally Jews don't uh, charge each other interest for loans or whatever. And the same thing goes for the other religious group that uh, he uh, Clopper Eric Clopper brought up in his uh, the bloodletting and the blood rights uh, kind of argument, which was Muslims. Uh, if you actually study uh, Islamic economics, it's actually practiced throughout the Middle East. I would recommend a book. It's called uh, Islam in the Mammon. Really good book. It's a it's a study on Islamic economics. I would recommend it anytime, any day, if you're ever curious about that kind of topic. Uh, but they don't charge each other interest either. And to such a degree, even today, that's why you'll see a lot of people who are of Muslim faith here in the United States. They don't actually own a lot of cars. It was actually interesting. I did this. I did a study on this one, and Muslims don't really own a lot of cars. They traditionally live in really tight knit communities, and that's why they have such an uh, in group, because they provide pretty much everything each other needs. Because they live in close proximity, so they just walk to one another. Why is that? Because in the American culture, when you buy a car, how do you do it? With a loan, which would lead to interest. There you go, and yeah. that's against their faith. So right. when people do buy a car, they actually traditionally do it in cash. So it takes longer to be able to do. So I've actually, I work Which with a... Which is a reasonable thing to do anyways, but... Uh... <laughs> right. But most yeah. people can't throw down like $20,000 in cash. Right. So same thing with buying a house. That's why their home ownership is rather low. Because a lot of people can't just throw down one hundred and twenty, fucking $240,000 on a house. Right. Uh, so, but with that being said, like you have a lot of in-group preferences that are are showing by the fact of these kind of sacrifices, these religious ideologies, these economic ideologies, it all comes back together as this religious fundamental practice that create and kind of cycle this in-group uh, kind of ownership with one another. You brought up the whole circling of the wagons. That's what they're all doing. Right. And you see this in other cultures that are less religious, like the Romas. The Romas did the pretty much the same thing. They circled the wagon and became a lot of nomadic where the gypsies come from. They circle the wagon. They, they have that. they have like a, a a an in group rule against doing work. Like you think you think not having you think not doing interest is is debilitating. How about how about you're not allowed to work a steady job? You know you can do side gigs. You can you can play the guitar on the street. You can do a little bit of lawn mowing for your you know neighbor friend from the the Gentile community in France or whatever. But you're not allowed to work a steady job at a factory or something. If, if you're Roma, supposedly, that's, that's what I've heard. Well, the, the only, I only have one experience with a, with an actual Roma who actually practiced the idea that he's not allowed to work. And I asked, <laughs> when I asked him why, it was because he's actually not supposed, to, it's, it's kind of like a, a cultural practice that they are not allowed to have a, um, a profitable amount of work that you're not paid for. So it's basically like if you're working, the extra amount of money that you are worth, the value that you produce, let's say my value, my work is only valued at $10 an hour, so there... I'm paid like 7 So that profit margin between 7 to $10, that's for, that is restricted in their culture. Oh, so they're, they're the original proto-Marxists then. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> now, again, I only have one issue, one interaction with a, a genuine Roma who celebrated in not having any kind of work other than the work he practiced himself. Sure. So sure. that may not be the overarching cultural norm, but that was his. Yeah. Well, that's what I've I've heard. And, and it's these weird in-group sort of rules and customs that seem to, to keep these groups cohesive. And they also, you know, just from a... a personal aesthetic lens they're kind of what gives these cultures their unique flavors and so it makes the world a a fun place to travel in um but that's sort of not a very strong moral position just an observation um but but getting back to to clopper and circumcision um i i think he touched on what he he thinks that this in-group preference and uh, and and solidarity and this differentiation from other groups was also the source of a great deal of anti-semitism in in the world hey one of the most interesting points he brought up was that when when gentiles in the middle ages saw jews performing the more extreme forms of circumcision they uh understandably if incorrectly 
thought if that's what they do to their own children, imagine what they might do to non-Jewish children. Yeah. And um, of, of course, the whole tribal perspective makes that view kind of uh, moot. But emotionally, you can understand where, where they're where he's coming from. A little bit. Uh, yeah. I, a lot of that anti-Semitism, like we saw a lot of anti-Semitism uh, for a really long time. But we've also seen uh, anti-African kind of cartoons and illustrations of that nature where uh, back in the 1930s, they would have illustrations of black people who are kidnapping little white girls and, and murdering them, which was sure. uh, absolutely false. Uh, because sooner or later, you're always going to find those like, oh, look, here's a singular story of pretty much this same thing happening. Yeah. But it, it doesn't really encompass the entire nature of what that group or in-group is doing. So not every African uh, during the 1930s was kidnapping little white girls and raping and killing them. Just the same thing is like, I'm sure you're probably going to find a singular case or a couple cases of Jewish people killing non-Jewish people. I brought up uh, in the talk before we got to this was a story that was put forward uh, of an orthodox, an ultra-orthodox uh, Jewish person killing or stabbing six people at a gay pride parade. Right. Although, although it happens, it's exceedingly rare. Right. And that's, and that's why that story got so much traction is because how often do you see ultra-orthodox uh, Jews stabbing random people? It, it never happens. Well, well the, the arguments for anti-Semitism that I've heard aren't usually based in Jewish terrorism. Although there are people who make that argument. There was a, a, a U.S. warship that was false flag attacked back in like the 50s or whatever um, by Israel. It, it happens, but it's it's not rare. The usual arguments are that you know, they are subverting our culture, they're subverting our society. And it can be compelling because there's a degree of truth to it. Although I'm I'm unsure if it's how much of it is intentional or if it's just incidental. It's like, oh, we're allowed to charge um, you know, usury basically to outsiders, so there's a business venture, so let's do it. Um, there's there's nothing really intentionally subvertive it, it, in in that particular case. But, Which I would like to state that uh, I know multiple Jews, and they get charged interest just the same. So right, right of, of course, yeah. Uh, so mo like, modern society. I like get a little card that says, "Hey, look, I'm Jewish. I don't have to pay tax, <laughs> or I don't have to pay uh, interest." But but I have my white privilege card, so we got a <laughs> uh, we got an advantage on the Jews there. No, um, yeah. it's uh, the. This, the universal to me appears to be, and, and tell me if you agree with this, it seems to be not distrust of Jews or distrust of blacks, but, but distrust of the outsider generally, in whether you're in Jewish circles or American white circles or European or African or Asian circles, the distrust of the outsider, um, outsider as such. Uh, is is the problem and and the reason anti-semitism seems to be the the predominant shared um prejudice is the jews just seem to move around so much that everyone got a chance to experience them as the outsider um i don't know it's that's what it looks like to me because i know that i mean in my own ancestral history the irish and the english didn't exactly trust each other and probably distrusted each other more then either one of them would have distrusted a stranger that they didn't know um, because of that history of animosity. Yeah. You you see that repeated, though, I mean, not just with Jewish culture, but with a lot of different cultures. You see it in the Irish. Uh, you see it with sailors. You see it with, uh, we even call it still today, like, man, I got gypped. And traditionally, you're referring to gypsies, which are the Romas, because they moved around a lot. I literally never knew that. Saw really? that connection before the the phrase. I, I mean, I've I've used the term gypped, but I never thought of it. Oh, that comes from gypsies. Duh! Like in hindsight, it makes total sense now. But anyways, I'm glad I've taught you. I'm, I'm glad I've taught you something. <laughs> so but yeah, it traditionally comes from the like it's a short term for a man. I got gypsied, and it's because that normally is an idea that I got robbed. Right. And when you get robbed, it's normally seen as the Romas because they would move around a lot. They were rather nomadic for a good long time uh, before they got you know their own culture, their own state, really. Uh, but even today, it actually is still rather pervasive. There's a there's a documentary from the BBC uh, that was created that says uncomfortable truths that are real. And I would recommend looking this up. I wish I could link something in your video. 
Um, we can add it later. But so. it was it was actually created by I believe it was the one of the parliamentary uh, members that was the head of cultural diversity and equity. Hmm. And he's talking about this, and I'll I'll send you the video afterwards. I think you'd love it. And it's and it talks about crimes that are are normalized or that are normally seen by one specific kind of group uh, that are almost cut and paste almost whatever culture you're in once you hit a certain cosmopolitan uh, less uh, homogenous kind of culture such as Canada you see it in America you see it in Britain and and now Germany you see a lot of these is certain ethnic groups commit certain crimes so like whites we traditionally do the vast majority of alcohol-related crimes, whether it be drunk driving, whether it be assault-related alcohol experiences, anything revol revolving around alcohol, that's on whites. I remember okay. reading a story of um, a uh, guy sitting at a uh, gas station counter, and suddenly a man walks through the gas station on a horse. man rides this horse down the aisle, grabs an 18 or 24 rack of beer, rides up to the counter sets it down pays for it in cash the guy's like why are you on a horse and the white dude answers well we were too drunk to drive so he <laughs> rode his horse to the gas station to get more beer well Anyways. doesn't can't like not ride so i guess uh, i'll give it to him and and, uh, and in in the stereotypes defense it, on on reading that story my first re reaction was like oh, i would do that <laughs> yeah, I have no doubt. So you're also the first type of person who would come into the hospital with like an arrow through your leg in some way or another. It's like I was drunk. I don't know what happened, man. I actually just cut myself with a with a sword the other day. So you're, you're not wrong. <laughs> you didn't even have to say it. You didn't even have to fucking say it. Alcohol um, was not involved there, though. So, anyways. Yeah, but the uh, but the one portion that he brought up is the fact that yeah. People who are normally of African descent create, uh, do a lot more violent crimes, but Romas actually are the vast majority of pickpockets. Right. Like, it, it is by far a huge majority. Like, I think it was in the 70 to 80 percentile are all Romas who are traditionally the ones who are, you know, yeah. pickpocket people. And that's it's still kind of the scene as that traditional, oh, I got gypsied, I got gypped. Someone did a highway robbery on me, someone stole my wallet. And, and, the group you would expect to be involved in the most white collar crime as the as the the dominant group in the white collar world would be would be Jews and it's it's funny because white collar criminals do end up in prison um, when they when they're convicted but they Jews Wasn't... are still rather underrepresented in prison and and so the fact that they commit the majority of I don't know if it's a majority of white collar crimes because they're still a, a pretty heavy minority in the United States but um, they're 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 pretty heavily over overrepresented in the in the white collar crime world in the same way that whites are with alcohol and um, blacks are with violence and Roma are with um, these other sorts of things and and none of these predispositions necessarily says that any one group is is predisposed to crime as such um yeah. it's just like oh of course the people who are in the business of alcohol are going to be doing the most alcoholic crimes the people in the white collar world are going to be doing the most white collar crimes people on the streets most are going to be doing the most street crime so on and so forth so see now i'm actually curious and this was just simply because when I think of white collar crime, the last person I can think of that committed like a huge white collar crime was Madoff. Uh, is Bernie Madoff? Yeah, and well, I'm actually that was the kinda, biggest one. Yeah, and I'm actually kind of curious uh, whether he is or is not. Yeah, though apparently that wasn't uh, always the case. There, I've I saw I read an interesting article that the majority of mobsters in New York back in the 20s and 30s. Were actually not Italian. There were a fair number of Italian mobsters, but there was actually a fair number of of Jewish mobsters. Um, so that was kind of interesting and, and rather successful ones too. But okay. that's but, sort wait. of on the border between street and white collar. By the way, I looked it up. Yeah, apparently he is. Apparently, apparently Bernie Madoff is Jewish. Um, yeah. There's even a Vanity Fair article wondering whether or not the amount of years in prison he got was because he's Jewish. So mm -hmm. is there a punishment for being Jewish? <laughs> so, uh, 
so with that being said, like we we kind of touch on it, we kind of like hopped on and off of it a little bit. Uh, you brought it up a little bit earlier, which was the Jewish question. Oh, right. Which isn't exactly. Uh, it's hard to pin down exactly what the question is in the Jewish question. And the way I've always interpreted it is, uh, like we've already, I think, established that there's there's an outsider um, distrust that I think is natural and healthy. And you can appreciate and admire outside groups without necessarily trusting them. Because as Nassim Taleb points out, it, it makes the most sense to trust people who have skin in, in the game, in your game. And if you don't, um, if some outside group doesn't, you know, win or lose based on how you do, then you shouldn't trust what they have to say to you or about you. But you can still admire and and respect and learn from their cultures and traditions. So it seems to me that the Jewish question is, is there something special? Is there a, a special reason to distrust or, or dislike the Jews? And, I mean, with this circumcision thing from Klopper, it seems like there is something special. There's something unique about them. Does that is that a reason to dislike them and my introduction to the jewish question although it wasn't referred to as such was actually friedrich nietzsche and in the antichrist he he talks about the jews as being in many ways the most interesting people in the world the most persecuted but nietzsche was a very strong anti-anti-semite he he had kind of contempt for for anti-semites and i think it was because he admired the 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 voracious um, Jewish affirmation of life. He sa he has a line in there, uh, something like, "When posed with the question to be or not to be, the Jews contemplated it. They thought about it deep and hard, and then they very carefully said to be at any price." Which sort of brings us back to circumcision and Klopper's whole thing. If Klopper's presentation is true, and I think his science seems to be pretty pretty solid for the most part it's like man that is a very heavy price to be paid but if it if that price that you paid bought you survival through in-group solidarity through social cohesion through through maintaining that group in the face of the most persecution probably any group has faced um i mean what an extraordinary accomplishment and what an extraordinary affirmation of life and I think what Nietzsche was worried about, and I think he's right in saying, is that if you hate this group, if you um, oppose this group especially and uniquely, you are you you distance yourself and you run the risk of hating that affirmation of life, which we thought he he thought we should actually adapt, not in exactly the same way as the Jews, but but at least but at least to to consciously choose life over death which he thought was represented in christianity well that is at any cost uh i wouldn't necessarily put it at, at any cost i do see the idea of a tribalistic uh tradition that has lasted the test of time because let's be fair jews are one of the oldest kind of uh, oldest kind of people on the planet, right? Would you agree? Yeah, okay. you could you could take Armenians and Phoenicians as some some comparatively old groups, but but on the whole, I think the Jews are definitely yeah. in there. In in which case, I don't necessarily think that it would come down to at any cost. I think it's a matter of they were one of few that are successful. Um, it it kind of reminds me of God. What is it called? The paradox, uh, the Fergie paradox. I think it is. Uh, it, it's the idea of, of life on other planets. Okay. Uh, I would have to double check it. Uh, but the, I know it starts with an F. But basically it's the idea of if there is life on outer, in outer space, why haven't we found it? And the idea wow. is because there are certain barriers that they have to go through to not only do they have everything in the entire you know, universe to actually say, yep, these are the conditions capable of, of creating life, then you have to have certain catalysts that actually start the beginnings of life. Then you have to go into the idea that they haven't become extinct. Then you also have to get to the point where they have now extinct themselves. Then you have to get to the point with all of those things. Then they've also 
come up with communicative devices that are able to, you know, go throughout uh, throughout the galaxy, throughout the universe to be able to reach us and we can perceive it. And then the last one, of course, is that they, they didn't die and get killed off. Or even if that communicative device is readable by us as anything other than static. Right. So maybe that's why we have it. Fermi. It's the Fermi paradox. Uh, and so that's why we keep getting into this thing. It's, it's not a matter of survival at any cost. It's maybe it's the fact that we, if we exist comparatively to planet, uh, other life on other planets, it's a matter of they were one of the very few uh, kind of peoples of old that have actually existed the test of time in human conditioning and human progress. Most civilizations have not only fallen, but the people have become overwhelmingly either uh, interbred or they've become extinct. Right. We look at we look at Neanderthals and we look at Cro-Magnons and we look at I think it's what is it six other kind of humans that became, uh, and we don't ever really talk about the Neanderthals. We don't talk about a lot of the other ones because they're extinct. Right. It's either that or they've interbred and they no longer are recognizable as a people. So maybe it's not necessarily that it's life at any cost, it's preservation of one's own culture, and that one just so happens to have lasted the test of time, comparatively to almost all other human nature kind of, uh, or human adaptations to human progress. Right. Well, I, I don't think the the uh, Jewish rabbis and intellectuals would disagree with you on that. I mean, I don't I don't think very many Jews are are active. Woody Allen aside. Are pursuing individual immortality, right? Um, they're, they're looking for their their. <laughs> Woody Allen has this thing about. I'm I'm not looking at, at staying immortal through my work. I want to be immortal by not dying. So far, so good. Um, <laughs> Just waiting another twenty years. Yeah. When, uh, when his like thirteen year old child wife sooner or later has to bury him. Oh God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another weird. weird tangent we could go down there but um i'm not gonna but that's a hollywood yeah. thing that yeah yeah it's uh I, I don't know i think it's it's all always been about the survival of the of the group and your posterity i mean that's that's what are the american founding fathers were talking about when they wrote the um constitutions like this is for us and our posterity and they live on in in many ways through us and and that's a it's not just a metaphorical thing uh, through the documents and the accomplishments. It's a literal thing because they laid out a a legacy that aids in the survival and the success of their offspring, their children. And there, there are probably living descendants of, um, if not Jefferson, then you know Adams and Washington and other people um, alive today who are benefiting from the Republican the republic that they've inherited from their parents. And I think the Jews did exactly that except instead of a nation they gave and, and created this religion that's had that that effect um and uh it, it seems to be working reasonably well well it, and i kind of want to go back to your the original statement that you made with the whole jewish question thing is is there a reason to distrust them mm-hmm more and, so than the Chinese or Saudis or Russians and so on. And I think that's an easy question personally. I, I've always found on this, my side of the scale is no. <laughs> uh, I may be, of course, I may be wrong. I've, I've, I could be wrong about a billion things. Mm -hmm. uh, but every time I think of this, uh, I think a, every time I argue uh, the Jewish question with uh, not necessarily you. You've actually been really receptive in in kind of a lot of this kind of uh, questioning. Thank but you. a lot of the people that I do end up debating this with end up being uh, very close-minded. It's the fact sure. that they are they are not to be trusted. They are, and they uh, kind of like in in a book, culture of critique. It's they f they keep falling on a scale of. Uh, happenstance almost it's something that they are attributing malice or menace with that a lot of times as you kind of put it is it may not be directly attributable to them it's not intentional right so i i keep seeing like well why are why are 
and even they even say oh. this in the BBC is like, yes, Jews do happen to be end up ending up in like really higher positions or in banker positions or high yeah. in paid uh, financial places. Milo admitted that. M- Milo, yeah, Milo Yiannopoulos, yeah. Yeah, Milo is even Jewish and he's a practicing right. Catholic. Right. Um, although, although it, it, important point is that Kevin McDonald in his book doesn't argue that the Jews are doing this. In a, he's an anti-conspiracy theorist. He does not believe yeah. that this is some kind of intentional thing. He thinks he's a, an evolutionary biologist or evolutionary psychologist. I'm sorry, and he argues that it's a it's a biological thing. It's it's a survival strategy that they've adopted, and that it's it's in their in their psychology now um yeah. which is an interesting argument um it's it's difficult to to prove one way or the other um i'm i find it not i'm not sure if i'm compelled by it or not i'm i, I find it interesting but not like operating on it yet but but the closed mindedness is definitely there and frankly i i kind of see it on both sides <laughs> Um, but, but there are some people who are just like, it's the Jews, ma'am, triple parenthesis around everything. Yeah. And it's very... Uh, it is incredibly close-minded. And and I think, yeah, there there are certain things, like all religions, you're allowed to criticize them. If you're allowed to cr- criticize Islam, like coming from an atheist standpoint, I criticize religion a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's because that's why I'm an atheist, is because I criticize the faith that I first practiced and I fell away from it. Uh, you can criticize practices, belief, cultural norms of religious teachings, religious traditions, and I think it's important for you to do so, including the the, the mullahs, uh, you know, sucking a baby's penis. I'm not a huge fan of that, and I think oh, it should be don't, don't, don't criticize Islam and their mullahs for what the moils do. <laughs> there we go. The moils, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Islam does a lot of bad shit, but not that. Yeah, but like, <laughs> no matter what, you should be able to criticize things, and I think the 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 closed mindedness right. of well you can't criticize Jews because you know Holocaust I'm like well we're not doing another Holocaust we're criticizing a cultural norm or a or a practice and principle that's that's not ethical right or not moral anymore same thing for Islam yeah I don't think that you should be doing these kind of practices in a liberal secular society and I think it works well within our rights but then I also see it on the other side which is yeah those same kind of people triple parentheses the Jews are everywhere kind of people yeah. Uh, well, nowadays you, you, we're getting to a place where you can get in a fair bit of trouble for criticizing the modern r- religion of of uh, progressivism. I think that Jonathan Hyden and Peterson are right in calling it a, a religion. Um, people certainly act like it. They circle around it. There are sacred commandments. There are holy texts, and um, and and the, and all the works. So uh, being able to criticize religions is 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 important. But but whether it, whether there's something special about the 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 Jews in particular and Judaism in particular, it's an interesting question. I'm increasingly coming more and more on the side of Nietzsche uh, and saying, you know, distrust, you know, people in Congress who are dual citizens, for example, but not because the dual citizenship happens to be with Israel, because if someone had dual citizenship with Russia, you know, could you even imagine? <laughs> Could you, could you even imagine, you know, and they would be right. They would be right. You, you don't want people with, with divided loyalties like that running, running your country. And is there, is there something, um, special as far as, as, uh, goodness or distrustfulness with the Jews? I, I don't think so. And I think there is something uniquely admirable about, um, about the Jewish religion in in what it's willing to to sacrifice to to preserve themselves, that's life affirming. And people should be very careful in denouncing something of, of that spiritual nature, uh, because you 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 separate yourself from from the from the value that you're denouncing. I think so you you brought up Peterson, and yes. I think anybody who's who's a uh, even somewhat familiar with Jordan Peterson. Uh, is talking about cultural Marxism, right? And its destructive nature. Right. Okay. So I don't know if you re- remember this story or not. Natalie Portman was just in the news yep. a little while ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and it was, she's kind of being denounced, and I think they canceled an event with her simply because she was actually denouncing some of the uh, the Jewish traditions, the Jewish way. She herself is Jewish. 
Um, mm-hmm. And she's starting to fall away from it, starting to attack her own. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. when you're talking about is it a religious practice, I'm wondering which one will win out for those who, for the cultural Marxism and the uh, and the progressivism that's starting to per- to become so pervasive into every single culture in the United States. It doesn't matter whether you're black, white, Mexican, Jewish, Christian, atheist. It doesn't matter where you are, what you're coming from, or what identity group or tribe that you self-identify with. It's starting to reach into everywhere. Right. And I think, and I think especially with the Hollywood elite, they're the most likely to go into that form of progressive religiosity. So is it potentially, which one's going to win out? The survivorship of the Jewish faith, or is it going to be that progressivism that we're seeing become so pervasive and so influential? Well, if I had Jewish friends, or if I was Jewish, I would advise them to choose their their ancestral faith. Because I think that the, the liberal progressive humanism is a well, it's a path of death, basically. It's a path of demographic death. It's a path of of, I mean, and you can see this, hear this in Klopper's speech. It's all about individual autonomy. You own yourself. It's all about it's all about you, and I, I and it's not about investing in the future. It's not about investing in in, in the group, and the group could, in theory, uh, live indefinitely. But you are going to die as an individual, and so if you if you put all your investment in in the things that are going to die, and I think that that. Jordan Peterson has attempted to um, deal with the, the JQ, and I think he – I love Jordan Peterson. I think he does tremendous work. I think he did a, a, a relatively abysmal job um, on, on this particular subject. Um, I think he should not have waded into it. <laughs> and, and Vox Day does a pretty good job of taking down why he got that whole statistical thing wrong. But there was a quote that I – found uh, a friend actually pointed it to me when i was writing in defense of hatred is a a jewish rabbi named rabbi ben porat who talks about how the jews that wander away from traditional judaism seem to as a group consistently find themselves in communist circles in progressive radical policies that seem to accelerate anti-semitism and and that cause other people to rightly in his view resent them now i wouldn't go as far as rabbi ben porat does who straight up he didn't defend hitler but he basically said of course it's understandable why hitler hated the jews he was right this this rabbi says and he says you i like that you have to classify that as this rabbi says yeah it, it it's important to do in these days, you know, um, and, and I think that just so everybody knows, neither one of us are advocating. <laughs> right. Hitler was obviously wrong, um, and we're going to stick work, with that. Work will set you free, my friends. No, um, no, he's uh, <laughs> bad, bad jokes, bad jokes. No, um, I, I think he's right, though. I think these the re bringing your your attention and your value back to the group um that's where where not just survival uh and and being free from the the deep resentment of other groups because being an outsider is not going to to free you from from you know the distrust of other groups it's natural to be distrusted by other groups but at least when you're an outsider you know where you stand with with someone else they 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 know not to trust you they know you're an outsider and that rabbi ben port character also quoted uh, Richard Wagner, a noted anti-Semite from the 20th century or late 19th, and Wagner had a quote about saying, "You know, the 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 Jews that are Jewish, I don't like them, but what do I care?" Basically, but he what he said he particularly didn't like what he what he really hated were the Jews who pretended to be German and diluted German culture in that way. And I mean. You can you can take either side in the argument of like are Jews German? Um, I'm I'm slightly on the side of they're 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 Jewish and they're separate based on how Jews tend to self-identify, which is as as Jews first and then Germans or Americans or whatever second. But you could take either position on that. Um, but the 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 cultural dilution that that merging of cultures causes does lead to real resentment. And um, I, think, 
I, I think if, if I were, again, if, if I were Jewish or if I had a lot of very close friends who were Jewish, I, I think the, the better option would be to, to lean into your ancestral tradition as hard as that is. And if nothing else, Eric Klopper does make the case that, man, leaning into that is a real sacrifice. It is. And, and I think the Jewish people are, are one of very few who have to deal with this kind of issue. I think the only ones who even come close to it, again, are, I've brought them up before, is the gypsies. Uh, I, I see the gypsies and the Jewish tradition as very, is very parallel. Uh, one line is just slightly shorter. And it's because a lot of people said the same thing. Are you, are you Roma? Or are you gypsy? As well as French? As well as German? Or which are you? Are you gypsy or are you, are, are you with us? And the same thing goes for the Jews, where they have kind of a weird intermingling of the faith mixed with the people. Right. And that, and that kind of separation slash inseparability uh, between that kind of idea identity really calls into question of what you were talking about is loyalty. So, and if you notice, Christians don't really have to deal with that. Right. You can be Christian and you can be in the Middle East. You can be Christian and American. You can be Christian uh, and Venezuelan. You can be Christian and Peruvian or wherever the hell you are. Being Christian doesn't call under scrutiny the identity of, of your nationhood. It doesn't take away your national identity. And on the flip side, you have groups like the Amerindians who there's even some linguistic confusion. Like, like are they American? Well, it depends on what sense you're using the phrase American. But they, they self-identify as like, I am Navajo. I am Comanche, first and foremost. And there's there's no confusion about what anyone is there. Um, although there there might be some dispute about who who is more American in the sense of land ownership, but um, it, it's like the the opposite of the problem of confusion about loyalty that you're describing with the the Roma and the Jews. Um, it's a fascinating subject, and, and there's a I think we're going almost close to an hour, so we should probably close up soon. But there are some. You and I could literally talk forever, man. Oh man, we could. We'll have to do this some more, sometime more, more Saturday morning caffeine streams. Um, but to to close, there there are a few interesting articles I think people should should check out. There's, of course, the uh, the um, Eric Klopper speech. People should should definitely give that a listen. It's an extraordinary performance. It is a performance. It is a, it is it is acted. But I think I, I believe it's authentic acting and performing um <laughs> i'm doubtful i mean when yeah. he when he sits up in the very beginning he says like i normally wouldn't have the have the uh you know the the spine to be able to do this kind of thing and then he like threatens to pull his dick out on stage eh. yeah and then he pulls out a some sort of well, well let's not I, ruin I, it for anyone um but rob uns has a a, a fascinating little piece oddities of the jewish religion um, I'll post the link to that in the uh, description. And, of course, um, my friend Aiden has uh, an article called The Jewish Question for Normies over at Countercurrent. So I'll, I'll link those two um, in the description I, as well. But, I would like to claim that, one, I haven't read any th all, any three of those things. and so Oh, okay. 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 So I don't lend my name to the credibility of any of those three articles. Of simply course. Because I read them. Well, and, and, and the fact that, that we're linking, I mean, we're, we're doing this whole discussion about a, a speech by this guy, Eric Klopper, Klopper that, that I believe to be incorrect. So, so linking something that we find interesting doesn't necessarily mean advocating or believing it's true. You know, we're, yeah. we're, we're both coming out saying, like, we think anti-Semitism is wrong and there's good reasons to not be anti-Semitic, even though it appears – and, and I think I think liberals are going to need to start acknowledging this. There are what appear to be good reasons to be anti-Semitic. And as, so long as people don't acknowledge those reasons, they're not going to be able to defend and, and to attack anti-Semitism. You have to understand both sides of the argument if you want, to, no matter which side you want to be on, if you want to defend it rationally. And this is where we keep running into that that weird hitting your head against the wall kind of criticism. Right. Is a, that you, you can be against a practice yeah. without being against the religion or the person inherently. Uh, if you, I disagree with, you know, sucking a baby's dick and regardless of religious practice. Me too. I know, right? 
Um, and I don't think that that, it, that would make you an anti-Semite. I think right. if you don't like a person simply based on the fact that they're Jewish, that would make you an anti-Semite. Uh, but not liking observable practices that they've had for a very long time, I, I don't think that, that would ever attribute you as, a, uh, as an anti-Semite. Of course. Well, we've been going for about an hour. I got to head to work in a few minutes. So um, I think we should probably close up. But great talking to you, Kyle. I'm sure we'll do more of these down the road. And uh, uh, thanks for chatting. It was always a pleasure, man. I'm always open to it. All right. Take care. You as well.